so for me, the fact that my kids have empathy, um, the fact that um, they're compassionate, and that they're going to be human beings that I can be proud of, to me, that's successful. Thank you so much, Senator Dinger, for your time today. It is a true honor to be with you. And I know that um, mental health is a, an important policy issue that's close to your heart. You've spent a long, many, many years working with law enforcement and the community on, on mental health. And when we talk about mental health, you know, there's really two ways to think about it. Mental health as a clinically um, diagnosed medical illness and mental health in the context of well-being. And I want to start off talking about the former, um, since you've worked on it for so long. What, over the span of 20 years, do you see has kind of happened in terms of the incidence of mental illness? Has it gotten better? Has it gotten worse? What have your experiences um, brought to bear? How can, how can we think about that? Well, thank you, Pooja, um, for having me here. I'm so excited for this conversation. Um, you're right. I've spent a lot of my career dealing with behavior health, um, started off with behavior health in the criminal justice system. And, um, you know, 20 years ago, the stigma around mental illness was just so extreme. And um, I will say what I've seen over the years is that stigma lesson. And we're talking about mainstream society, right? We haven't even started talking about stigma in communities of color um, and in different cultures because that's a different level of stigma. But um, in, in terms of stigma, I, I do think things have gotten better. I think people's understanding of mental illness has become, has evolved. Um, you know, we, however, we still live in a society where our number one mental health hospitals are our jails and prisons. So clearly as a society, we do not have uh, infrastructure set up to help individuals before they get into such extreme crisis. So there's a lot of work to be done in terms of the uh, diagnosed mental illness. And you mentioned about the undiagnosed. And this is where a lot of work still needs to happen around trauma and how people process trauma and um, how that uh, trauma exerts itself in our lives. And, you know, this is again, another issue that I feel very passionate about, especially in terms of, uh, and I'll just say women, because they tend to be survivors of a lot of um, trauma. And uh, again, when you take a look at the criminal justice system, they really have not understood the fact that trauma exerts itself as a reaction, not just as a memory. And so you're again, seeing the criminal justice system being used to re-traumatize um, survivors who are trying to deal with their own trauma. And then of course, we have just the mental um, illness and well-being um, that is not diagnosed, but is, is just so equally important in yes. how we show up in the world, how we do self-care, how we take care of others. And it's not at the level of a disorder or a disability, but it is something that we need to work on. And especially for our youth and COVID that has come to the forefront on how yes. that's affecting them. But again, a lot more work needs to be done in this area. Yes. I'd like to go back to, you had mentioned that underrepresented populations and the connection with mental illness. Can you expand on that a bit from your experience, please? Absolutely. You know, you hear in so many different cultures, and I'll speak specifically about the Indian culture, right? You don't talk about the person in your family that has mental illness. Yes. It's the old stories of where they're locked in the house and, you know, you, you keep them away from society. Yes. And, you know, you're seeing that change too. You're seeing people come out and um, talk about their depression, talk about their anxiety, talk about uh, having a bipolar diagnosis. And that is really important because stigma is 100% curable. We yes. just have to talk about it. 100%. So um, I've been on the board of NAMI, East Side of the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And, you know, we had reached out to the Indian associations in uh, Washington. And it was really cool to see that they now have a group called Lokya Kahenge, which mm. means what will people say? 
And that speaks directly to the stigma that um, is in so many uh, communities of color yeah. where they're unsure on how the society is gonna treat them, how their community is gonna treat them. And so they don't talk about it. But yeah. once you do, they realize there's a network of support because mental health and mental illness is something that each family struggles with regardless of the socioeconomic status, their education level. Yes. And yes. so the more we talk about it, um, the more we get rid of that stigma and really start treating it like we would cholesterol or a physical you know, illness. Yes. Physical illness. Yes. So that's really important. Yes. You know, it's exciting to, to know that we can elevate and enhance lives in the future by really digging into this, this aspect of health, the mental side of it, which we've ignored for so long. And it's such a silent, lonely suffering that goes on. Um, I want to talk about now mental illness in the context of well-being. And I want to read to you a great definition that I found about this. Mental health is a positive concept related to the social and emotional well-being of individuals. Having good mental health or being mentally healthy is more than just the absence of illness. Rather, it's a state of overall well-being. I find this so profound because we don't talk about mental illness or excuse me, mental health this way. We talk about physical health and we go to the gym and we try to enhance physical health. We have a whole horizon that we can now explore to enhance our mental health. And this topic has exploded in awareness. Um, Obviously, we've seen most recently Simone Biles, Naomi Osaka, the tennis player. We've seen Prince Harry talk about this. It is beautiful to see this now changing. But I'd love to hear from you about what you think the reasons are behind why this is becoming so spotlighted. And, and what are the reasons why we are having a hard time now maintaining our mental well-being. I got to say, I love the questions you asked. They're just so profound and so many layers to it. You know, this goes back to the stigma. I think it's now okay for people to talk about it. And so people are sharing their stories. Um, and, you know, um, um, social emotional well-being is just so important. And we're seeing that in our schools. In the state of Washington, we actually require our schools to, to deal with this topic. And so we are seeing that and that really is a way um, to maintain classroom structure too, is to really understand, yes. you know, why are children acting out? Why they may have a reaction to something that's been said. And that understanding that, again, that may be a reaction to a trauma that experienced, or it may be a reaction to just the way they're regulating um, their, their bodies and really understanding the social emotional um, component of people's lives. And then when you take a look at the workforce, right? When you are running a business or you are an employer and you're looking to hire people, at the end of the day, what are you looking for? You mm -hmm. really are looking for people who know how to show up, who can do critical analysis and are good employees. And that social emotional well-being is such a huge component of it. Yes. Because this will, you can learn a lot of things. You can learn how to do processes. You can learn, yes. you know, computer science. But what makes you a good employee is not necessarily um, you have the ability to learn, but it's also the ability on how you're showing up and how you're dealing with those interpersonal relationships. Because at the end of the day, that is what really makes our world go around is how you're showing up yes. in the world and how you're interacting with others in the world. So I think the timing um, for this is key because we have worked through a lot of the stigma on mental illness, really talking about the diagnoses and the crisis. And this is the next step, right? Like you mentioned, uh, physical health. This is that preventative care. This yes. is us going to the gym. This is us making sure we're eating our fruits and vegetable. And it's the yes. same for our brain and yes. for our emotions, making sure we have that Absolutely. to take care of ourselves. Yes. Just like, you know, there's a, a wonderful spiritual leader. His name is Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. And he talks about how, you know, meditation is really like a toothbrush for your brain. I just love that 
you know, metaphor um, that we really do need to clean our brain and clean our, our mental state as much as we're pumping iron and running. Um, I'd like to talk about self-awareness. Uh, I heard in a podcast, your son shared with you a beautiful Greek proverb, and I want to read it to you. A society, society grows great when old men plant trees whose shade they never know they shall, they, whose shade they know they shall never sit in. It's such a beautiful saying, and I think so well connected to your job as a, legisla a legislator, as a politician, it is beyond difficult to have all of your wishes manifest while you are in office. You're betting on your legislation to outlast you, to outlast your life. I wanna talk about your journey personally to becoming a politician because you seem so well fit for your role. And obviously you've loved justice and, and, um, and, and community, I think from a young age. There are so many people, adults, who struggle with self-reflection, with self-awareness, knowing who they are. And then they get stuck into vocations and into jobs that really don't reflect their authentic self. I'd love to hear from you what epiphanies, what experiences, what life conditions you had to help steer you in a path to doing something that reflects who you truly are. My goodness, that's some question. Um, you know, I, I think I'll just start off by saying that life's too short for you to um, work in an area that you don't like. I think, first of all, it's really important to make sure that you enjoy the work that you do, um, that when you show up, you find meaningful in that experience, so some kind of meaning. Um, and I'll just say, you know, a lot of my life choices, of course, were um, influenced by the people around me, by yes. uh, a lot of the women in my life. Um, I, early on, was interested in um, working on violence against women. I was always very proud to call myself a feminist. And so I got in, and my grandmother, um, actually in India, used to work with survivors of domestic violence at a time when wow. people didn't even have the phrase domestic violence. What a role it was model. More, it was more about just empowering women and, and helping women. And um, so I grew up with very strong grandmothers on both sides of the family. And um, and I got involved in, um, in taking a look at date rape, um, when I went to college at UC Berkeley. And so I knew early on that I wanted to be a lawyer. I knew I wanted to be a prosecutor because we see over and over again that um, women especially are victimized a lot, right? They're on the receiving yeah. end of domestic violence, sexual assault. And we as a society really have not been doing a good job in, in helping those survivors. And so I um, got involved in working in domestic violence after I got involved in working with date crime, uh, with uh, date rape. And uh, I was involved in one of the very first um, South Asian uh, domestic violence organizations in Berkeley called Narika, which was starting. So I used to volunteer at a shelter in Oakland called a safe place while Narika was starting. And so when I moved over to law school here in Washington, I wanted to continue my work. And so that's when I helped create Chaya as a South Asian domestic violence organization. And Chaya of course means shade. And um, that name for the organization was very specifically taken because it's about empowering and helping, right? So it was on your weary journey, let us provide you with shade. So we're not going to replace our judgment, our thinking for yours, but really provide you that shade as you continue on your journey. So. So that's how I got involved in um, doing work with survivors. And, um, and you know, you, you just kind of have to be open to where life takes you. I never ever thought I would run for office. I um, loved working at the prosecutor's office. I created and ran a therapeutic alternative unit. So I did a lot of work, um, you know, in the cutting edge of alternatives to incarceration, taking a look at, 
uh, therapeutic interventions instead of our standard criminal justice reform, did a lot of work with um, crisis intervention and de-escalation training for law enforcement. And what ended up changing the um, trajectory of my life was our national election in 2016. I, for one, was completely appalled um, by the result. I just could not believe that a man who um, boasted about sexually assaulting women, who um, made fun of people with disabilities, who was so racist openly, um, just got elected to the highest office in our country. And, um, and so I actually attended my first Democratic Party meeting that December because I had never wow. been. And, um, and then, and I knew I wanted to do something. I just didn't know what that something was. And then a couple of things happened. I um, had gotten involved in hate crimes after 9-11 when a sick cab driver was assaulted in Seattle. So I used to do a lot of work with hate crimes, with doing uh, cultural competency training for law enforcement around sick culture. And uh, that December, the local mosque in our area had a safety forum. So I was there along with six other police chiefs and this huge auditorium full of people and people talking about how scared they were. And I remember sitting in that room thinking, I don't ever remember feeling this scared growing up in this country. Yes. And then two days later, I was at the Indian Association of Western Washington. Um, I was there along with another prosecutor from our office, um, someone from the FBI and the US Attorney's Office. And it was the same thing, Indians in one of the most affluent areas in Washington talking about how scared they were. And so that weekend is when my husband and I talked and we decided I was going to run for office because it's so critical for people um, to see people of color in, in um, the halls of power, yes. to really get that sense that we all belong. This is yes. all of our country and we really need to step up and participate in democracy because democracy is not a spe spectator sport. It's right. a team sport. So you got to show up and you got to play. And um, so that's how I <laughs> decided to run for office, but definitely a very unusual path to a lot of other politicians who um, kind of work um, into the system. You know, I showed up and the political party was like, I'm sorry, who are you? Because um, yes. they didn't know who I was. Yes. And, you know, I'll say when I got elected, I doubled the women of color in the, in the Senate from one to two. Um, <laughs> really shocking you know Washington is yeah. seen as like this progressive, progressive state yeah and two women of color in the entire state senate we're up wow. to five um and you know a handful is always a good number to have yeah. um but we need to grow that as well yeah and lastly I'd like to discuss this big word we call success you know we define it in a way that I think stretches people you know, gets to, to even burnout in a way. Um, I want to read you two quotes on, on success. And the first is by Paul Coelho. What is success? It is being able to go to bed each night with your soul at peace. Paul Coelho. The second is by coach John Wooden. Success comes from knowing that you did your best to become the best that you are capable of becoming. And, you know, I think going back to, you know, how we discussed being a legislature, uh, a legislator and, and, and a, a public servant, it's not easy to go to bed every night knowing that you've promised your constituents something. And, and of course, knowing that it's very hard to get legislation passed. And, and what you do a lot of times talking to constituents and, and helping communities is not measurable. I'd love to hear from you how you think about success as it relates to your career, firstly, and secondly, how you would define success in general. You know, that's such a great, yeah, so such a great question, uh, because I have, you know, I've been, since getting elected, I have been asked about success multiple times, and I do have a standard answer that I will give you uh, later on. But, um, you know, when I reflect back, and, you know, I've had people talk to me about their perception of my career, even at the prosecutor's office, and, um, you know, a lot of people define that as very successful, right? Because I created a therapeutic alternative unit, a unit that doesn't exist in most prosecuting attorneys 
offices in our country. And, you know, I helped create it years ago. Um, and then just the work we've done in, um, in talking about, you know, therapeutic alternatives to incarceration. And so I think it depends on your measurements, right? Is that successful? It depends what you're measuring. Um, and then even as a legislator, right, they track, you know, how many bills have you passed? And apparently yes. I pass the most number of bills every year. So going to your definition of success, is that successful? Um, to me, it's more important, as I've, I've mentioned, is that you do the job that you get enjoyment from. And I think if you show up it with the right attitude about a willingness to help others and make sure you're being effective, I think you will naturally be successful. Um, when people ask me personally on what I think is success, um, and this may be a cliche, but I think it's absolutely true. To me, success is how my children show up in the world. I love that. So for me, the fact that my kids have empathy, um, the fact that um, they're compassionate, and that they're going to be human beings that I can be proud of, to me, that's successful. Because that's how you're changing the world. And as a parent, you raising that child um, that reflects your values is the biggest thing. What they do in the professional life, what they do in terms of programs, all of that is going to be a reflection of how they are as a human being. And you know, this comes full circle to what we talked about education and the next generation. And to me, that's what it is about. It's about how you show up and how do you interact and how do you behave. Um, and I do think the rest of it follows once you have that fundamental down. So I am most proud um, of my children. Such a beautiful answer. And as a mom, that's what I think about all the time even before, you know, I started an interview like this is, is, you know, what is it? What, what is our why? And um, that's so, so beautifully summarized. Thank you so much for sharing it. And, and more importantly, thank you for taking the time today. Uh, I, I had such a great time speaking with you and, and I, and I hope you um, enjoyed it as well. Thank you so much, Senator. Dana. Thank you. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was such a great conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. For more on how to find calm and freedom in a fast-paced world, hit the subscribe button below. And please share this wisdom with someone you love.